I thought what we think about today, talk about today, is a hugely important decision which British voters are going to make on June 23rd, just in three weeks' time. Um, today, in three weeks. And the decision is whether Britain should retain its membership of the European Union or vote to leave it. And uh, the, the opinion polls are very curious. Um, opinion has swung, but the most recent polls um, announced today, uh, one by ITN, gives the outs a 3% lead, 47 to 43, 44. Um, and it's neck and neck from other very recent polls. Two or three weeks ago, there was a bigger majority for staying. Uh, before that, a smaller majority for staying. So it's all to play for. We don't really know what the result will be. The European <coughs> Union grew from the original six to nine in 1974, when Britain, Ireland, and Denmark joined. Britain had a referendum in 1975. We voted yes by almost two to one to join. Norway also voted and voted no, and voted subsequently no. So they have turned it down twice. But Britain, Denmark, and Ireland came, grew, came in. Greece in 1981, and then Portugal and Spain in 1986. Three countries which had, until just then, or shortly before, a history of extreme right-wing military dictatorships, and the European Union was seen as a beacon of democracy and a very important event for these countries to be brought into the Committee of Nations, and uh, uh, everybody welcomed them. Then, in 1995, it was the turn of Austria and Finland and Sweden to join. Why did they join? Because the Soviet Union had collapsed, and it was incumbent on those three countries on the fringe of the Soviet Union to remain neutral and independent from what was seen as a capitalist uh, uh, right-wing kind of body, uh, which Soviet Union strongly disapproved of, of their joining, and within a short while after the Soviet Union collapsed, in they came. Then, in 2004, there were uh, accessions from Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, the Baltic Republics, Czechoslovakia, which had just broken into two, uh, into the Czech Republic and Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, and two islands in Mediterranean, in, and the Commonwealth, incidentally, two, Cyprus and Malta. They all came in in 2004, and this was followed a little bit later by uh, also Slovenia at that point, it came in, and then later, part of ex-Yugoslavia, and then another part of ex-Yugoslavia, Croatia joined just a couple of years ago. So that makes 28. And enlargement has had many effects, most hugely positive on the GDP of most countries uh, that have joined, pretty well all. Um, in the case of Britain, it has led to a phenomenon which is unfortunately very controversial. There has been large inflow of labor from Poland, particularly, but other East European countries, the Baltic republics as well, um, inflows of labor amounting to uh, a net uh, around 100,000 a year or more for most of the year since. And Britain decided in 2004, along with Sweden and Ireland, that we would welcome the new mem laborers, workers from the new countries to come in straight away. And the evidence, most of it developed by a very good economist, a friend of mine called Christian Dustmann, a German working at University College London. Uh, he's the main expert on this. They're, they're both the numbers that have come in and their tax contributions and their use of uh, public resources. And there's no doubt, according to Dustmann's results, that there has been a major net contribution to the government's finances. These people pay much more in income tax and national insurance contributions and value-added tax than they draw out in welfare benefits or resources connected with free schools and hospitals. One of the key claims by the people advocating out from the European Union is that immigration from the European Union, free immigration with no restrictions, has been uh, is part of the 
constitution of the European Union, something that David Cameron tried to get marginally renegotiated with only slight changes agreed, um, and they think this is uh, very, very unfair. Attitudes in Britain on this issue are very polarised. Most young people, most graduates, almost all economists think that it's been a huge net advantage to Britain. But we do recognise that there are people whose position in the wage hierarchy hasn't improved as a result. What do the remains people say? And what is the economic analysis that can underlie their cause? One key argument is that uncertainty has a very big corrosive effect on investment. And there's no doubt that over the last six or nine months, investment intentions and investment expenditure, the private sector, has weakened. And weakened after a quite strong rise in profits, huge rise in employment, reasonably re uh, robust growth, much faster than almost everywhere else in Europe. Um, why is investment so low? Because if we think of our theory, Avanesh Dixit and Pindyke have a very important book that comes out in the mid-1990s uh, on irreversible investment. And the idea behind irreversible investments is that it pays to wait and see. If we examine the theory of games and ask ourselves, what would happen if the remaining 27 countries get together and debate the question, when Britain has left, debate the question, how should we treat Britain? Should we be nice to Britain? <laughs> should we say, look, there are 63, 4 million quite well-off people who buy a lot of their goods. Shall we ex continue to export our goods to them? Or shall we be nasty to them? And I think even an elementary analysis of game theory will suggest that the remaining 27 will be very concerned to try and prevent defections by other states. So if Germany, the largest contributor to the EU budget, and Sweden and the Netherlands were to leave, the rump are not net contributors. In many cases, they're huge net beneficiaries. So what do you do? Do you want to reward Britain for leaving? No. You want to punish her. It's rational, even if it hurts yourself. Even if you deny access to the British markets for your own exporters. It's rational for the European Union negotiating all these complicated issues and coming to a stance, much as they might regret it as individuals, to really punish Britain. The biggest worry I have of all is this, that a lot of businesses, the few businesses that have really prospered in Britain in the last few years, have not been owned by Brits. We used, 60 years ago, to have a huge car industry, Europe's biggest, British owned, almost all of it. All the British owned firms went bust. They have been sold or survive, if at all, under Korean, Japanese, Chinese, German, Indian, and American ownership. And they've thrived. And they and their suppliers produce together a larger value and volume of cars in real terms than we ever did before with our own car industry. And why are they in Britain? Because of common law, because of relatively free pro-business attitudes on the part of the continuum of governments, right through, right and left. And above all, access, tariff-free, quota-free, to the big European markets. And our fear in Britain is that these guys will hop off slowly. They at least won't extend their investments in Britain. They will, in time, transfer to the mainland. South Africa trades a lot with Europe. And we, you trade probably within Europe more with Britain than with the rest of our uh, European Union partners put together or very, or nearly so. Germany. Germany first, Britain second. Germany is a huge market. I know South African farmers are able to uh, negotiate access for their products. And it's brilliant from their standpoint and yours 
because winter occurs at different times of the year. And you can get your fruit and vegetables and your wine into Europe at just the right time. And uh, that's very, very helpful. But um, the British market is considerable. And I'm afraid that all the negotiations that were agreed between, say, South Africa and the European Union 28 would have to be at least discussed, possibly renegotiated in detail, certainly as far as your British market's concerned. I mean, it might be done over a weekend. It might take years.